uh, speakers on the uh, podium will be uh, addressing the remarks in English. If it would be helpful, there are, of course, headphones, uh, because sometimes it may be a little difficult with the microphones to hear, particularly if you have not accepted my invitation to move closer to the center. I would uh, like to express my appreciation uh, not only to the panelists who I'll be introducing as they take the floor, uh, but to the Secretary General for um, this initiative uh, for Security Days and for including, including me as a moderator uh, as I wind up a four-year tenure in this particular OSCE role and uh, look back toward uh, nearly three decades of working with this institution, this, this organization, and its predecessor, the CSEE. Uh, maybe there's something that uh, we can draw from that experience, especially based on the, the wisdom of all the people to my right. Uh, I also take it as an expression of uh, confidence from the Secretary General that um, not all the answers to the OSCE questions come from Vienna, but those of us who have worked in Warsaw and in the field uh, may have uh, something to add, and, and there are um, interesting perspectives from up here and I'm sure around the room. I encourage everyone to be active in the discussion period that will follow, but first we'll have uh, about uh, 10 minutes of remarks per speaker, more or less, um, looking uh, to have some discussion period uh, before we, we wind up at 11.30. Um, the topic for today's, for this morning's session is building a common future, promoting conflict prevention. And in so doing, I think we'll talk not only about conflict prevention uh, narrowly defined, but all of these issues which in the OSCE context we uh, describe as addressing the conflict cycle from the creation of just and democratic societies where the rule of law is present to addressing the violent conflicts that have sometimes emerged when uh, those systems break down. And to help us today, we have four distinguished speakers. Uh, I'll introduce them as they make their remarks. Um, but uh, just to say that we have both an academic perspective and a practitioner's perspective in uh, many cases combined in the same individuals who have been studying the region and the uh, thematic approaches to conflict prevention and resolution for uh, a number of years and even decades and have been on the ground also working on these issues. Um, the first uh, speaker who will uh, address these issues is Ambassador uh, Istvan Germati, who is president and CEO of the International Center for Democratic Transition in Budapest. Um, Professor Germati, um, Ambassador Germati, um, has worked both in the academic and in the practical practitioner uh, diplomatic world on uh, conflict issues, um, including as a representative of his own government uh, of uh, Hungary uh, in uh, places ranging from the IAEA to negotiations um, on conventional arms uh, in Europe. And he has uh, more recently uh, led non-governmental efforts to look at a range of security and democracy issues. And um, Istvan, I'm going to hand over to you with just uh, one uh, final remark. And that is that I would hope that in uh, addressing these issues from your own perspectives, each of our panelists um, can look at something which in the jargon of our OSCE we, we tend to call best practices and lessons learned, which I, I sometimes think when we use that term, it's a bit of intellectual laziness because we don't know exactly what we're, um, what we're asking. But in this case, I'm asking something very concrete, and that is if you have examples of conflicts which you have been involved in addressing professionally or in terms of analysis over the years, have you seen something that's actually worked which might have relevance to future conflicts? And have you seen something that was tried in good faith but didn't turn out really to be the right approach that might give us some hints as to how to better work on these issues in the future? So. Uh, to 
the good and the bad of specific cases as well as whatever else you had on your mind. Professor, Ambassador. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning to everybody. Usually I don't like conference rooms, but I think coming from outside where it is 30 degrees, I think it's very pleasant to be here. Uh, I also want to, to, to thank the Secretary General for his initiative and for inviting me. I want to make one remark that I, I expected you to look much more worn out than you do. Uh, I don't know if you know that he has celebrated his birthday and if we started two days ago, for which I want to congratulate. And I expected that you were uh, doing different things in during the night, but probably you are more professional than that anyway. so. Congratulations, in any case, uh, or condolences, whatever you uh, you find more appropriate in our age. Uh, my first remark is that I was pretty comfortable uh, what to speak about until your your last remark, Mr. Uh, Chairman, because when you asked me to speak about best practices and lessons learned, it's an extremely difficult uh, challenge uh, to me. I can give you best practices for my, or lessons learned from my, my family life, probably where we prevented a lot of conflicts. Uh, but uh, internationally, it's very, very difficult. But I will come back, because there are some lessons to be learned, not necessarily learned, but to be learned from, from some. Uh, I want to, to start, our topic is conflict prevention. Uh, and I want to, to ask the question myself, why does conflict prevention not work? And what does conflict prevention mean, really? And I think we have to, to specify, first of all, the, the term conflict prevention. Well, if we want to prevent conflict, conflicts in general, we are not doing good to ourselves or to the world, because conflicts are that bring the world together. We make progress uh, through conflicts, uh, through not preventing, but uh, but managing and solving conflicts. What we are talking about, and I want to talk, talk about, is, is probably preventing armed conflicts rather than, than preventing conflicts. Of course, not non-armed conflicts should be, should be resolved too, but, uh, but not prevented, but, uh, but, uh, but solved. Secondly, why is it that we, we don't really succeed in conflict prevention? And I will use this term in the, with the meaning of what I meant before. Why don't we succeed? When this question is asked, we always, the first scapegoat we, uh, we find is international institutions, international organizations, that they are not up to, the, up to the job, which is true and not true. It is true, they are not up to the job, uh, but they are not up to the job because governments don't want them to be up to the job. So it's a, it's a good, I think, the, probably the most important and most useful thing OSC and other organizations can provide, service can provide to, to governments is to, to offer the, the scapegoat role, taking away it from, from, from governments. But we need to know, I think especially here, that international organizations can only do so much, uh, as much as, as governments allow them and equip them to do. And it's not much uh, these days. Uh, the second answer is because we, we are facing uh, new types of conflicts, which is also true. And of course, solving new types of conflicts or even managing new types of conflicts, not to mention preventing new types of armed conflicts, is very difficult. Uh, the question is, of course, is this the real reason? The question is also, are these conflicts really new? A new type of conflicts? These are definitely new types of conflicts if you compare them with the conflicts that we have experienced, our generation has experienced during the Cold War in Europe, in the transatlantic uh, area. But if you ask African countries or Asian countries, they will say we've had these conflicts before. And if you ask European countries, uh, European historians, we've had these conflicts too, a few hundred years ago. Uh, the problem is that now, the same conflicts that emerged in Europe uh, in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, which were related to, to nation building, uh, state building, and modernization, uh, are emerging today. And therefore, I think it's not too much exaggerated to suggest that we are fighting the wars of the Middle Ages with the weapons 
of the 21st century. And that's why it is extremely important to, to try to manage these conflicts. But this is also not the real reason, I think. Uh, and I, I would like to, to mention the real reason, but before I do that, I want to say that, that uh, which is the usual disclaimer I should have said in the beginning, that carrying the title of ambassador doesn't mean that I necessarily uh, present the views of my own government, and the next sentence you will understand why I have to say that. I think the, the real uh, problem, the real responsibility lies with us, with us in Europe, and increasingly, unfortunately, in the United States, that we grew uh, similar to the Roman Empire in the, let's say, the fourth century. If you look back to the, to the fourth century, the Roman Empire looked like like the, the peak of, of development. It was hi extremely highly developed. The people of, of the Roman Empire, of course not the slaves, but the citizens of the Roman Empire, were enjoying life. They, were, they have produced philosophy, poetry, literature, uh, all kinds of, of arts, uh, enjoyed life. They know how to eat, they know how to drink, they, know, they knew how to enjoy sex. They didn't know one thing, how to defend their civilization because they were not ready to do it. They thought their civilization will last forever. And I think we are in a, of course, all parallels um, have, a, have, have some deficiencies, but I think we are in a very similar situation, especially in Europe, and I'm afraid to say also increasingly in the, in the United States. Uh, we are struggling with a crisis, with an economic crisis, but this economic crisis uh, compared to what people in other parts of the world have to live through, uh, where there is no crisis, um, we are still very rich, very wealthy. We live in a safe world. Um, we, we, we face problems and challenges that are huge to us, but could be negligible for others. Uh, but we still uh, pretend that we cannot do anything because of the, of the crisis. And this is, of course, not only an economic crisis. This is a much more, it's a political crisis, an institutional crisis. I would say, referring back to my previous sentences, it's also some kind of a civilizational crisis that we have not known for for a long time, but it's now here with us. Uh, we are not ready to, to stand up, to defend what we, uh, what we have achieved. Uh, we are not ready to defend our, our lifestyle. We are not really ready to defend our values, uh, sometimes not even our interests. We try to make peace with those who, who we cannot and should not make peace with. Interference, uh, and I say it here in the OSC, the OSC or the CSC, which invented the concept of, of, uh, of non-interference, but at the same time also the obligation to uh, interfere, if you wish, uh, in case of gross violations of, of human rights. I look at, at Adam Rothfeld. We, I think, drafted the, 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 the relevant paragraphs together in, the, in 1988-89. Uh, Adam, if you would try to, to sell it to the OSC today, what would be the result? So I think we are, uh, we are getting increasingly, uh, increasingly unable because we are getting increasingly unwilling to do things that we have been doing. Uh, we meaning the Western world, at that time we belonged to the others, but we also did our share, I think, in the late 1980s. Uh, I always think that if, if uh, the Western world from the United States to Germany uh, would have done the same and would have sought uh, the same way uh, in 1989 uh, as, they, as we do today, we still would have Janusz Kadar and Jaruzelski. Uh, they might have died anyway, but the regimes, uh, I think it, 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 it's very uh, alarming that we are not, uh, not doing, not even trying uh, to do, to defend our, our values and our, our interests in a, in a proper way. Of course, we blame it that we have no money for the military, we have no money for anything, we, we need the money at home, uh, but compared to, to our uh, GDPs, this money is still uh, minimal. We are not even ready to pay sufficient contributions to the OSC, which is a very cheap and, and very flexible organization, which could do a lot of things uh, within uh, its area of, uh, of uh, interest. Uh, but it's true also for, uh, for many other organizations. 
we are inflexible in institutions. Uh, we are, uh, but when we when we see some problems, we try to to solve substantial problems by institutional changes, and of course that doesn't work. We try to adapt the conflicts to the institutions and not the institutions to the conflicts. Um, and we we don't want to be to be really involved. Syria is the best uh, uh, or the worst uh, example that that can be quoted. Now I, I try to to find uh, some of the some of the successful conflict prevention uh, activities, but unfortunately, the the afterlife of these successful conflict prevention activities also shows that that if conflict prevention is successful but it's not sustained, um, it will be become uh, a failure. And I name two countries, one Macedonia or the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, uh, and the second one is Albania. You will remember that when the war in, uh, in former Yugoslavia, actually then it was not former, in Yugoslavia broke out, we deployed a battalion of, of troops uh, in, uh, in Macedonia uh, in order to prevent the spillover of the conflict to Macedonia. One single battalion was enough to prevent the spread of the war to, to Macedonia. Can anybody tell me that it was very uh, expensive to, to do that? Especially not, I was, if I'm not wrong, it was a Swedish battalion and the Swedes paid for it. So, but, but even then, even then, if you can prevent, could prevent uh, the, the spillover of a, a nasty war, and there were of course other reasons too, but if you could prevent the spillover of a nasty war uh, to Macedonia by deploying preventively a battalion of troops uh, there and some accompanied some political uh, diplomatic measures. Was it too difficult? Was it too expensive? Or was it worth the investment? I think it really was. Uh, but then we thought the conflict was over and the conflict in that, uh, in that meaning was over, is over in, in, for in Yugoslavia and former, now former Yugoslavia. But now we have some local conflicts, one of them in Fyrom, in Macedonia, because we withdrew and we left them alone. We thought that we can achieve, we can have, we have a lot actually, to achieve something that I, I think was the best agreement regulating inter-ethnic relations in, 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 uh, in the former Yugoslavia, maybe also in modern day Europe, the Ohrid Agreement, which is falling apart. Uh, for many reasons that I don't want to, to go into, I just want to illustrate that successful conflict prevention with no follow-up will become uh, a failure. The second one is Albania. We all remember uh, Operation Alba where nobody was ready, no institution was ready to do it, so the Italians took the courage and did it. Did it very successfully. Albania had the, the chance to become pretty quickly uh, a country that was uh, uh, admissible to, to NATO and was uh, eligible for at least starting negotiations with the, with the European Union. But I remember an American friend who in 1993, when, when we were still, still struggling for including Hungary into the first uh, uh, group of countries which would be invited to join NATO, he said to me that, that now I think before that, President Clinton decided that, that he would include Hungary, so that might have also have an effect on this American official, but, but he said that, that uh, we only should invite countries to join NATO where I don't have to worry about the outcome of the next elections. And you, Hungarians, in 1993, are a country where I don't have to, to be worried about the outcome of the next elections. Now we will have elections in Albania, are we worried? We are. Uh, we are worried. It's, uh, it's been a, a, a problem uh, to, how to how to consolidate political and economic life in, in Albania, a NATO member. Uh, so we had a very, uh, very successful, by military means, conflict prevention again, and not only military means, conflict prevention activity and operation in, uh, in Albania. Then we left it, and then the conflict prevention failed. Uh, in many respects. So uh, the lesson learned or to be learned is that is the following. First, to pre and, and I'm, I'm not telling anything new, but I think we, we should still uh, tell these truths because we, we seem to have forgotten them. First, conflict prevention is cheaper than conflict management, conflict resolution, 
uh, and restoration after conflict. Secondly, conflict management is not only a conflict management a stability tool, it's also a value issue that we need to, to keep in mind if we are still, still serious about our, own, about our own values. We must not forget that countries that, are, that forget about defending their values will forget about defending interests and they will then fail and maybe fall. The third is conflict prevention might succeed if you do it in time, uh, if you do it the right way, but it will fail if you abandon uh, the, the conflict after that. And I think we, these are three lessons that we, we need to learn and with that I leave the OSC to do it. I gave all the advice you need, uh, Lamberto, so I think now you can do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll use Istvan rather than Ambassador or Professor to make clear your uh, independent and refreshing perspective. Um, and uh, thank you for actually providing us with some concrete examples which others may have comments on. Uh, I could comment myself, but in interest of moving to the real experts. Uh, Ambassador Collins, Jim Collins is director of the Russia and Eurasia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, was, among many other things, my boss when uh, he was ambassador to the Russian Federation uh, a number of years ago, uh, has a distinguished career as an American diplomat, and since then, in both private and, and uh, non-governmental life, uh, continues to be active uh, in uh, work with Russia, not only through his uh, Carnegie Endowment work, but as a board member of the U.S.-Russia Business Council, the American Academy of Diplomacy, the Open World Leadership Center, and, and others. Um, Ambassador Collins has a <laughs> perspective on the conflicts in this region that we work on in the OSCE that I think is unique and valuable and uh, look forward to hearing uh, what you can add to our discussion. Ambassador. Okay, well, thank you <clears throat> very much. Um, and uh, thank you all for putting up with me. I, I, I have never served in OSCE, and frankly, uh, was never really much part of the OSCE community of, of diplomats and people who spent time working directly with this organization. But that doesn't mean I don't have opinions. And what I want to do is um, recall a couple of the points that were made by people yesterday and to talk about conflict prevention in a sense uh, from the perspective of what do we do to ensure that we don't get to the point of having to prevent conflicts. I want to start by recalling that yesterday I, I, one of the speakers I thought made the very good point that we are living in a world in which the kinds of issues that are going to confront this community, that is the, the OSCE family of nations, are changing the entire way the world is, is working. Now, it doesn't mean there aren't old issues. There are plenty of them. But the challenge in front of us is how do we deal with what is coming? And so change may well be the biggest challenge that the nations and the peoples of this region face. And I happen to believe that if this region doesn't manage and the coping with change well, then we're going to be without global leadership. Because it's only this region, in some sense, that has the capacity, it seems to me, to work on the issues that are going to confront the globe in any kind of a coherent way. So what are the kinds of change? Well, yesterday we heard about things like population growth and the pressure that's going to put on resources, on everything from water to food to, uh, to energy. We're going to face uh, new realities that challenge the capacity of institutions. In fact, I would argue already challenges the capacity of institutions developed over two, three centuries that simply cannot now deal with the issues that they face 
effectively and therefore don't deliver what the peoples of our nations need and want from our governments. So governments are going to have to find a way to expand their capacity to govern. I think we're going to face um, a set of, of accelerating and new sort of People keep talking about threats. I don't like the word. It, it, these are simply realities that are going to confront our lives with different issues that we'll have to deal with. So everyone's talking about cybersecurity today. Well, it's not just cybersecurity. It's the whole complex of things from privacy issues to security to uh, the impact of instant communication broadly on the capacity of people to govern themselves or to manage information. What do we do about the fact that organized crime today, for instance, functions like any big multinational corporation, and yet all of the, almost all the institutions we have to deal with it are national. They stop at somebody's border. We don't have a, a system to begin to deal with this. So I, I think uh, one of the things I want to suggest is that this community, the OSC community, which is inclusive, it's the only one that represents the, 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 the group of nations and societies that I believe is going to have to deal with these issues if we're going to have any coherent approach to them, really has to begin to think about how do we do that. Now, uh, I was part of a project for two and a half years that a number of people in this room were much more central to making what I think was successful than I was. It was called the Euro-Atlantic Security Initiative, and it identified a number of different issues for this community that lie at the basis of, I would say, the challenge to making progress, and then had some recommendations. Well, it was interesting to me that yesterday, uh, uh, while it was very flattering to know that people had paid attention to the report, Nevertheless, they picked out two things, I thought, that were interesting from it to, to speak about. One was the deficit of trust as a core problem across the region. That it is deficit of trust, in some sense, that lies at the heart of the problems because, not because we don't like each other, but because it gets in the way of our ability to cooperate or find common ways to approach the issues in front of us. It, it's a matter of, is confidence at a sufficient level to allow us to come to terms with something like a set of norms to begin to deal with cybersecurity? And frankly, we don't have it yet. And that's a problem. So the question, in some sense, was, uh, you know, how do we deal with that issue? And I would argue that if you're talking about conflict prevention, a lot of the conflict that exists or the, the kinds of things that end up getting to the point where we have to prevent people from killing each other tend to stem from the fact that they didn't get down to the issue of a lack of trust or an inability to deal with each other before you got to that difficult point. And so, to me, the, one of the challenges of this community is to think about how you can begin to attack the problem of the lack of confidence and the lack of trust among the members and between them, between East and West, between different countries uh, in, in, the, in the region, between peoples within the countries, as Istvan has just talked about. We need to begin to think about how do we deal with that problem and find some way for this institution, I think, to be the one that can, can do it. And I'll talk about some specifics in a minute. The second challenge I thought was interesting was the one where issues were raised that frankly nobody's really dealing with because you don't have an institutional structure that is inclusive enough to make very much sense of the way you deal with them. Now this is everything from climate change to, uh, to migration of people uh, from pandemic disease to, uh, to the, the, uh, the problems of organized crime that I mentioned. Nation states just can't deal with most of these issues anymore. They can close borders, they can, 
They can have health regimes internally, and maybe even in the EU you can do it. But the EU isn't the whole community. And the Americans think we can sort of manage everything, but it, you know, we don't do it either. We're, we're at a point where we have to find a way to begin to approach this question of dealing with these very specific issues that are coming in front of us that are not abstract and that affect the safety and the welfare and the health and the security of our people more effectively. Now, I don't think uh, if this community can't do it, if we can't begin to approach it as the Euro-Atlantic community writ large, the inclusive group, then I think we're going to squabble with each other and find uh, focus on our differences to the point where we can't even deal with cooperating on things where everybody knows we have the same interest. And that's a problem. So what do I think OSCE ought to be doing about this? <clears throat> I think uh, the first thing is that OSCE, in terms of, if you will, the dealing with this, in, and I would say this is at the sort of first level of conflict prevention. OSCE needs to realize what it is and what it isn't and what it can and what it can't do. Uh, OSCE doesn't have a very big army. So I suppose, you know, the old, the old uh, Stalin question about how many divisions do you have doesn't give us a lot of confidence. On the other hand, OSCE has some one extraordinary capability that, as far as I know, no other institution really has across this region. And that is the capacity to enlist broadly elements of societies from the private sector and businesses to institutions to churches to uh, NGOs and so forth and bring their attention and bring their capacity to bear on given issues that are identified as commonly needed, or commonly needing attention. I don't think there's enough made of that capacity, and I think that is one dimension of OSCE's work that deserves to have much, much more attention and focus than whether or not the council can get the right, you know, sort of uh, solution for, uh, for Macedonia. The question is, who do they bring to bear on the problems of Macedonia, if they can, for instance? So, you know, there's much talk about civil society and the role of uh, these, you know, it, it, well, it's, it's playing, or the role of new social communication and social networking. So, well, this is a tool. It's, a, it's what, you know, in the military terminology is a dual-use technology. It can be destructive, but it can also be very powerful and constructive. And it can help mobilize. So, I mean, it seems to me the OSC needs to begin to think very creatively and very actively about how we enlist the people that are necessary to do things and accomplish things in the future that governments will not be able to do alone. So I want to just take one example. Um, we, in, in the Euro-Atlantic Security Initiative, talked about a lot of issues, but one of them was historical reconciliation. Historical reconciliation uh, has a history. Uh, again, Adam Rothfeld uh, has done great work with this. Uh, uh, but you have French-German reconciliation, you have German-Polish reconciliation, and we have the beginnings of Polish-Russian reconciliation, historical reconciliation, and so Efforts to begin to get at the roots of some of the most long-standing historic suspicions and, and, uh, and, and issues. Well, if OACE were to take this as a priority and say, what we're going to do as an organization is, first of all, endorse this. We want to legitimate the idea that this is a good thing and an important thing and a critical thing for the future security of this continent to do. And we are going to say, we're going to have everybody in the governments of the OSCE agree to that. That is a political statement. It means it deserves attention. Secondly, it seems to me OSCE can then call on a variety of people in communities, from historians to NGOs to churches to all the people who play a role in making historical reconciliation work, not just governments, and say, we want to work with you to develop the best practices 
to achieve the goals of historical reconciliation. Now, it isn't going to be an instant project. But if you begin to have OSE stand as the one which can provide the capacity for people who want to undertake this to do so, with the knowledge that it has political legitimacy and it, it is important, and OSE will stand behind you, that's an important thing to do. And the third thing I, I would do, for instance, is I, it would be a very interesting project, I think. If you could get a group in OSE to come begin to develop best practices and, uh, let's say, the norms for use of historic archives, then everybody would have more or less a, a uniform code of conduct for the use of archives. This is not going to be easy. There are all kinds of people who don't want to open this or that and so forth. But, you know, working on this over time, I believe, even in some of the places that it would be most difficult, can in fact pay off. So, I mean, if you just took historic reconciliation, and I don't say this is the only problem, but it is a problem that erodes trust. It is one of the things that makes it difficult to meet challenges of these new, uh, to these, uh, these, in this new world. And you begin to have OSCE convene and, and promote the idea that we want to do this. I think it would strengthen the organization. I think it would also go a long way to getting at the root of some of the conflicts that aren't there yet, but are just waiting there. And if we look at what happened in former Yugoslavia, where everybody was arguing about over 1453, you know, maybe historical reconciliation is something we need to get serious about. So that, I, I would simply uh, like to leave with this, this, this group, the, the idea that OSC has incredible strengths and capacities that I, I, for one, do not think are used terribly effectively. Because everybody is focusing rather, uh, I, I think, narrowly uh, often on just what's the issues of the moment or what divides it. I would hope we can, we can sort of move beyond that. And Mr. Secretary General, I thank you for the chance to come and talk to you. Thank you, Ambassador Collins, for looking at the big picture and some of the real major challenges facing our part of the world and the world at large over the coming years, as well as focusing in very concretely with a suggestion of something that the OSCE might do more to address. And I think in focusing on the question of historical reconciliation, you implicitly also made the point that we're doing one thing right when we talk about the conflict problem as a cycle, because history and the future are so closely connected. And if we don't deal with one, we will have difficulty in approaching the other. Our next speaker is Ambassador Francois, Francois Alembrun, the permanent representative of France to the OSCE. Ambassador is a career diplomat who has a quarter century of experience working on issues related largely to international organizations and their approaches to uh, various problems. He's worked in the permanent representation of France to the European Union in Brussels, at the permanent representation of France to the United Nations, and now here as the ambassador to the OSCE. Uh, I think that gives you a great perspective on how different players in this complicated alphabet soup of the international community uh, have been addressing and attempting to prevent conflicts over the past uh, period. And perhaps you can uh, really drill in on some of those questions of what we've done right, what we've done wrong, how we might be able to take advantage of that experience as we build toward the future. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Doug, and good morning, everyone. Thank you. Lamberto, for giving me the opportunity to be part of uh, this uh, panel and uh, talk about uh, the experience of a practitioner. Uh, I will uh, mainly focus on uh, my uh, experience in the OSC uh, because it's very fresh in my uh, memory. I've been here for four years and I'm close to my departure. So it's, a, it's both a challenge and a privilege to try to um, deliver some testimony of what I have experienced uh, 
And uh, I think it's important to talk about OSC uh, uh, for me because I think conflict prevention is really at the core of uh, the OSC role. OSC is a regional organization in the sense of Chapter 8 of the UN Charter. You mentioned that I served in New York uh, at the mission to the UN, and I really very much uh, sense, that have, after having served uh, four years here, how much what we are doing here is complementary to uh, what the UN and is, is doing. And I, and I think Lamberto, who served in the UN, can, can also uh, confirm that. Uh, so when we are talking about the role of OEC, what the OEC should do in the future, there is something which is clear, that conflict prevention is something which will remain as, in my view, the main uh, role of, 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 of OEC. I would also mention that when I arrived four years ago, uh, this organization uh, was under the effect of a failure. Because uh, the war which uh, took place uh, in 2008 uh, in Georgia was a failure for OSCE and for the international community because OSCE was not the only one uh, involved in the, in the situation. But it was something which was a shock for our community. And I think that uh, it was very clear in 2009 when I arrived that there was a real will to try to avoid the repetition of such a situation. And uh, it was very um, clear in the intention of uh, the Corfu process, which I observed and participated to starting in 2009, that one of the real uh, purpose, important purpose of this process was to find ways and means to avoid the repetition of such a failure and to improve the capacity of OSC to prevent such a situation. And uh, there were a lot of ideas, proposals, which were uh, put forward by uh, participating states in this uh, very uh, active, uh, very lively process, a little bit improvised, uh, but very rich. And uh, many of us in this room have uh, a memory of, uh, of this process. I, I recognize, for instance, uh, uh, George Molna, which is really back <laughs> on the back of this uh, room and who took a, a very large part in the discussion on uh, conflict uh, cycle and conflict prevention. So there were a lot of ideas, a lot of proposals concrete ones, some more in general, and they were summarized in 2010 in the uh, draft framework for action, which was uh, presented in the Astana summit and which was not adopted in Astana. At the same time, the Astana declaration really emphasized the importance of conflict prevention for AC. But one year later, in 2011, the Ministerial Council was able to adopt decision 311 on the conflict cycle, and which really uh, takes into account many of the proposals and ideas which had been put forward, and which is designed to reinforce the capacity of OSC. But the question is, how can we assess the real capacity of OSC in the recent period? And I would like to take a few uh, concrete situations, few examples, in order to try to, to assess this. I would take three, three situations. One is Kosovo, last year, 2012. The second is Kyrgyzstan, since uh, 2011. And the third situation is the question of conflict uh, uh, prevention in the situations where there is a protracted conflict. Last year, 2012, the OSCE was uh, uh, requested to uh, facilitate voting in the Serbian elections taking place in Kosovo. It was a very delicate mission, very difficult, because it could have really been a source of tensions and conflict. And in a very short time period, the OSC was able to mobilize its resources to fulfill this, to, to fulfill this mandate.
by mobilizing, of course, the resources of the mission in Kosovo, but also of missions of OSCE in the region, and working together, and, of course, um, benefiting also from resources from the ODA. And it was, um, I think, a success. It was a success because it showed that in this situation, OSCE was maybe the only one who could do that, which could do that, which showed flexibility of OSCE, which would capacity to mobilize quickly its resources. It was possible because of political will and political leadership. And in this regard, I think uh, the role played by the chairmanship and the secretary general in this situation was very important. It was possible because there was, of course, support of all actors in, involved or interested. And I think that it remains as one of the main successes of OSC in, in, in the recent period, and which also would lead and will lead, I think, OSC to play a role in facilitating the implementation of the agreement between Kosovo and Serbia, which was negotiated in April, uh, thanks to uh, the EU. First situation, which in my view is very important to have in mind. Second situation, Kyrgyzstan. Of course, OSCE was not able to prevent ethnic violences which took place in 2010 in Kyrgyzstan. But OSCE was able to adopt a response with a very important conflict prevention component which is called the uh, CIS, which is the uh, uh, deployment of uh, police advisors having a role to facilitate relationship between the police and the population, to facilitate also better relationship between ethnic communities, implementation of human rights. It was a very delicate situation. It was a very, very delicate mission. It raised, at the initial stage of this mission, mistrust, criticism in Kyrgyzstan. But what is very interesting to see is that now, this distrust, which was very vivid at the start of the mission, has decreased and almost disappeared, and the Kyrgyz authorities are willing to prolong this, uh, this uh, operation, which is, once again, a success for OEC. Third situation I would like to, to mention, it's the conflict prevention role of OEC in the context of protected conflict. Of course, it could appear as a little bit uh, weird, to, uh, strange, to, to talk about conflict prevention in a protected conflict, because the academic view is that we have to talk about early uh, prevention, and then there is a conflict, which is a failure, and then we have to uh, look for settlement, and then a post-conflict rehabilitation. But in the reality, it's more complex, because in the aftermath of a conflict, there, there is a need when hostilities have ceased, but there, is, there are still risks of resumption of hostilities, to have conflict prevention activities. And in this regard, I think that uh, both the role of mediators, the role of CBMs, are important. If uh, we look at, for instance, the role of the uh, representative of the chairmanship for the conflict dealt with by the Minsk group, the role of the co-chairs between Armenia and Azerbaijan, we see that there is a role also of preventing resumption of hostilities. When we look at the role of the IPRM in the framework of the uh, Geneva discussions, we see also an important role of prevention for the OSC. I would also 
mention the important role of the High Commissioner for National Minorities, which is very important also. I will not try to cover all situations, of course, that the OSC uh, is, uh, is dealing with. But if I try to uh, draw some um, lessons or some uh, conditions which are important based on this experience, I think that political leadership is important for the, the OSC to be efficient. And of course, the role of the chairmanship in this regard is very important. The way Kazakhstan uh, reacted to uh, the situation in Kyrgyzstan, of course, was important for deployment of the uh, OSC presence in the south of uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan. Of course, the close connection, close relationship between Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan were useful. The role of uh, the Irish chairmanship last year was important. So I think, and of course, uh, besides the uh, chairmanship, the role of the Secretary General, in my view, is very important. And we saw that also in the Kosovo situation last year. So political leadership is a key for OSC efficiency. Second, I think uh, operational preparedness is very important for efficiency of the OSC uh, structures. We saw that in, uh, in Kosovo last year. And I think that all the efforts, the endeavors since 2009, in particular since the decision taken in 2011 on the conflict side, the efforts of the CPC, but of all OSC structures, in order to be better prepared, to have a, a culture of conflict prevention is a very important evolution and improvement. Third, I think that uh, it's very important for the OSC to be able to mobilize all its tools in the area of uh, conflict prevention in a narrow sense, but more broadly. And to be creative, and uh, some of the examples I, I gave show the uh, capacity of OSC to be creative in, in certain circumstances. But of course, um, conflict prevention in, by the OSC and in the OSC is not a technical issue. It's a political issue. And it's not only about using tools, it's also about creating conditions which prevent the uh, uh, possible triggering of conflict, in particular through improving implementation of commitment in all dimensions. In the human dimension, and I think the role of ODIA in this regard is very important, and the role of other institutions, in the uh, Paul Mill dimensions, and I think in this regard, the uh, framework of military transparency that OSC has is very important too, and has to be modernized. And in this regard, we still have some progress to make. And I think that more broadly speaking, conflict prevention capacity depends on the viability of our security system. And I think that the uh, conflict of Georgia in 2008 showed that this system had been weakened, weakened, needed to be strengthened. I think that the efforts made since then, especially in Corfu, Process, Astana, were important steps, but not sufficient. And I think we have a lot to do in the framework of the Helsinki plus 40 process in order to really reinforce this system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Holmgren. The uh, comments that you made, I think, were very much enriched by taking the time and the effort to look back at these uh, years of experience that you've had in the OSCE and to be concrete about 
cases where we've done pretty well and those where we... And many uh, uh, colleagues that are here today can confirm it. Uh, I'm very pleased that Professor Germati is, uh, uh, is worried about the elections uh, in Albania. But the problem that make a specific case Albania for elections is that the main political blocs are so close to each other that cre could, that could create problems in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the afterwards. We are not the case of Hungary when a party can win with two thirds of votes. The race there, the electoral race in Albania is, is very close and this make this electoral race uh, uh, extremely competitive. If this extreme competition makes worry Professor Germati, then it is okay. But let me tell him one more thing. Uh, here at this hall, last, fr last Thursday, at the Permanent Council, we discussed about uh, the latest report of, the, of uh, the representative of the freedom of the media of the OSE, which is a very important institution of this organization dealing with uh, very important standards for the participating state. And let me tell him that uh, this report and the representative herself was much more critical to those countries that have been admitted to NATO much earlier than Albania than for Albania. I thank you. Thank the Albanian ambassador for uh, his remarks and reminding us of the ways in which uh, Albania continues to be engaged with OSCE and others, and uh, perhaps Professor Termati would like to say something in response, but before uh, giving you the floor, I promised the floor to one uh, speaker on the right side of the room here, Mara Wright. My question will be directed to uh, Dr. Goldraith. Um, He's written extensively on organizational overlap, uh, the post-Cold War security, the post-Cold War mandates of many regional and international organizations overlapping, and the difficulty of carving a niche place for these organizations with a um, definite and effective uh, place of activity. Um, depending, you know, drawing from the things you've implied in your speech, I understand that you envision a more human security, soft security dimension for the OSC in the coming future, considering this organizational overlap problem. But I would like to hear more from you, considering uh, the fact that you've written extensively on these things. Thank you. All right, a specific question to Professor Galbraith on organizational overlap. We may have some uh, comment from Professor Germati, to whom I have another question that's come in from Twitter as well. But before I turn, to those two speakers, is there anyone else in the room who would like to take the floor? If not, we'll give one more chance after hearing from our two uh, speakers who've been uh, specifically addressed, as well as uh, the other two who may have some wrap-up uh, comments. Uh, Professor Germani, I don't know if you want to say anything uh, about Albania further. Um, I also had a question uh, that came in through Twitter about your remarks on civilizational defense, or as it was characterized in the question, a clash of civilizations. And the question is whether you see this clash fostering modern conflicts or preventing them from being solved. Uh, perhaps that's a fine distinction, but that's the, the question that's come in from outside. And I wonder if you want to take that um, as well as anything else um, for uh, uh, concluding comments as we move into the last few minutes. And then we'll give David the chance to answer a question, make concluding comments, uh, and our other two speakers, unless there's any last minute uh, intervention from the floor. Professor? Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I just have two remarks to my Albanian uh, friend. First remark is if I, if I were the permanent representative of my country, I would have done the same. Uh, I think he's done it very well. Uh, my second issue, second <laughs> remark is that uh, what politicians frequently forget, diplomats don't or shouldn't, that it's only friends who are worried about your problems. Your enemies love your problems. So uh, if you take it as a friendly worry, as you did, I think I have achieved what I, I really wanted. Uh, the second question is a little bit more complicated. You know, when, when we talk about, about the, the clash between, uh, between the end of history and the clash of civilizations, uh, I think the end of history theory is over. 
the clash of civilizations theory is coming back. But it's coming back in a, in a, in a different ways. Uh, it's coming back that we, because we recognize that, that uh, the entire mankind or, or humankind, if I, if I want to be politically correct for just for one minute, uh, humankind uh, does not belong necessarily to the same civilization. It, it is still not, I think, politically correct to say, but it's more and more uh, recognized that, that this is the case. And that raises really many, many questions. It raises questions about the, the future, uh, whether liberal democracy, as they've known it in, 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 in our countries, is really the ultimate uh, goal or the ultimate uh, station of this long journey of, of progress of, of uh, humankind or, or maybe there are some, some other, uh, what it really means, uh, what democracy really means. Is there a different, are there different democracies in different civilizations and different cultures? Uh, how to deal with this and, uh, and how to deal with, with different civilizations that exist uh, in, uh, in the days of globalization. Um, and I think these are the, the questions that will be coming up, among others, of course, uh, in, the, in the future, uh, which we will have to address uh, in a much more courageous way than we have done before. We have basically neglected it, and I just want, uh, in conclusion, mention one, one uh, kind of result of, of neglecting these, uh, these issues and uh, uh, quoting Europe as an example. I'm not talking about, uh, about the, the, the big issues which everybody has on, uh, on mind, but let me talk about Europe uh, in two sentences. As we have not been able, not courageous enough, to address real internal problems of our societies in, in Europe, be it indigenous or imported, like different kind of civilizations within our societies that have existed for centuries, like the Roma uh, in, uh, in our countries, including my own, my own country, or the, the immigrants in other countries, which tend to be Muslim. We left the, the, uh, the whole uh, public discourse to the extremists because traditional parties, left or right, were, did not dare to address these issues because, of, of, because they were not courageous enough and because of political correctness. And now we see the result. The narrative is basically determined by extremists, be it anti-Semitism or, or Muslimophobia or many other things in many other countries. It will be much more difficult now to turn back to a normal narrative, and I don't see really too many, too many signs uh, in, in my country or in many other countries actually in, in Europe that it would be happening, then it could have, would have been if we would have tried to prevent conflict, because this is a real conflict within our, uh, our, our society. Thank you for those remarks. And also with pessimistic remarks, you reminded me of one optimistic feature of our organization, which is that we did identify a number of those problems that uh, you have highlighted quite early on and the work that various parts of the OSCE, including my own, uh, are doing on issues of tolerance and non-discrimination and anti-Semitism and uh, other forms of discrimination, including against Muslims, is something where I think we do have a role to play and we have a conflict prevention role even if we don't necessarily always cast it in those terms. Um, before the session, uh, I mentioned to David that I'd glanced at uh, a book he's written about um, a range of uh, international organizations and how they work together in Europe. And he said, oh, I've written several books on this topic. Um, now I'm going to ask you in about 60 seconds uh, to uh, tell us what you can about uh, organizational overlap in the OSCE region, only because I want to leave a couple of minutes for each of our other speakers to wrap up. But if you'd like to uh, respond to the question and, and um, say anything else in uh, conclusion, I'd uh, give you the floor and, and then uh, turn to the two ambassadors that uh, have not yet had the chance to wrap up, if they have anything. Thank you. Um, 
Well, uh, the projects on organizational overlap have been largely designed to see whether or not uh, organizations rise and or international organizations rise and fall as other institutions or organizations take on their functions. And so can you have three organizations that do election observation? Sure you can, because we, we do have three. Can you have uh, three organizations that have the ability to use peacekeepers? Well, surely you can, because that's what we have. Yeah. Uh, can you have three organizations that can talk about arms control in some way or another? Well, we don't necessarily have three. We have two, for sure. But, but uh, as time goes on, does this make a difference? And does this make a difference to sustain uh, any of these organizations to the degree to which, um, which uh, you know, they, they have been important for European security in the past? And so you have two effects. One this is that you have forum shopping. If you don't get what you want from NATO or the EU, you come to the OSCE. Or if you don't get what you want from the OSCE, you go to the EU or something like this. So this is particularly a problem uh, that, that does exist. The, the second uh, issue is that, and something that I think that is even more interesting in a way, is really the, the, uh, the burden sharing relationship that you get between organizations. And I would say that there's a, very, there's, there's a lot of examples of burden sharing between organizations that happens. Um, you can look at the uh, 2004 and 2007 enlargements and see that the OSCE was very active as, a, um, as, a, as, a, as an observer, as, as a norm entrepreneur, as, as a standard setter for EU enlargement. Whether or not that's appropriate for its participating states is really neither here nor there. Right, is that the European Commission was using it for its own purposes, and, and that, maybe that's great for the OSCE or, or not. But again, you know, what does that what does that have to say about uh, the use of the OSCE in a larger security framework? Well, that suggests that the OSCE is doing a good job, or was doing a, a good job in in relation to the in relation to that. So I would say that in fact, it only um, it only uh, supports uh, the OSCE. I would think in, in doing this only to the extent that, in fact, it's recognized that the OSCE is doing these things, uh, as opposed to actually taking your ideas and reselling them back to you at a later date, which, which I understand is, is happening. The last thing I would say is, is, was I advocating a human security approach for the OSCE? I don't know that I'm advocating a human security approach per se. I think what I'm advocating is a return to the comprehensive uh, and common security approach to the OSCE. And with the idea that I don't think you can have a discussion around uh, the solutions to conflicts or the prevention of conflicts without thinking about the, the, the whole package in a way. And human security is part of that package. Thank you. Ambassador, any last words from? Thank you very much. Uh, um, reacting to the last oh, issue, yeah. um, I would like to, to s in thinking of this, the examples I gave uh, uh, earlier, I, I would say that, for instance, in the case of Kosovo, there were many organizations which were present, many, and OSE was active, was chosen to be the one. Why? Because it's unique. And it has unique assets. And I think you, you mentioned that. Composition. This large composition is a great asset because it gives also an image of neutrality and it generates trust. I think it's a very important asset for us. Of course, you have also the tools, the institutions, the field presence. These are unique assets which are very important. Of course, to use these assets, I would repeat something I said. We need political will and we need political leadership. These are also important lessons to be drawn. But of course, OSCE cannot act alone. OSCE, and it's also a lesson of the, some examples I mentioned in Kosovo or in Kyrgyzstan. The success of OSCE was also a success of coordination, of consultations with other international organizations, EU, the UN, and I think it's also a a, sec a secret and a factor of success for OSCE. Thank you very much. Professor Collins, any final words? I'm going to let the French have the last word. 
You just shut me up. <laughs> or maybe the uh, approaching coffee break is what uh, shut me up. I will um, not attempt to summarize. Um, I will thank all of the speakers and all of the uh, participants in the audience for what I think was a useful and interesting exchange. Uh, it went beyond conflict prevention, but it also addressed conflict prevention. And I think it looked uh, at some successes as well as failures in a way that may help us to think about how to address these problems in the future. Uh, to some extent, it only touched the surface of the problem because of the great extent of the issues that we could have discussed if we'd had more time. But again, thanks to all. I've been asked to remind that uh, the coffee break starts now, but that it will be followed by a session on transnational threats, building a common future, addressing transnational threats from a regional perspective. And with that reminder, uh, this session is closed. Thank you. <laughs>